All right. Well, glad everyone could come today. Um, you know, it's pretty short notice here on uh, given the presentation, but it all worked out. As we mentioned earlier, I just came from the New Mexico Mineral Symposium, just got in last night. So uh, again, pretty short turnaround here, but uh, no worries. We can, we, we can accommodate. So um, today's talk, um, I'm going to give just a kind of an overview of the Michigan's copper country, basically um, it's mining history and then a lot of pretty minerals. So with that, I'll uh, go ahead and get started. Before I do get started, however, I'd like to just um, acknowledge the many people that, that's listed here, many um, organizations that help me with this. Um, a lot of their photos I use in here, I have some of my own photos as well. Um, so things that I couldn't get or couldn't obtain, um, I depended on many of these people to get me. So I just wanna thank them for that. So I always like to start out by saying, well, where is this place? And so <clears throat> I know we have a worldwide audience today. So um, where exactly is the Cumanoff Peninsula? Where is this fabled copper country that we talk about? Well, this is of course on the left is the United States, um, continental United States. So we have San Francisco, LA, New York, Boston. I'm coming to you from just outside Houston, Texas. And we're going far to the north. We're going up into the Great Lakes region. And uh, this, of course, is Michigan, Lower Peninsula, Upper Peninsula, which is the best peninsula of the two. And when we zoom in on the Keweenaw, it's this little spike here that juts out into Lake Superior. So on the right side here, I have a Google Earth image. And so this is the peninsula. Um, and I'll just orient you with know, some places that we're going to go. This is Houghton and Hancock, um, home of Michigan Technological University and the AE. Seaman Mineral Museum, here's Calumet and Lorium, Copper Harbor way up near the tip. Um, down here we have Mass City, Ontonagon over here. And we're gonna focus a lot of our attention today on just a little strip of land from just south of Houghton in a town called Painsdale up to Mohawk. And the reason why we're focusing on this little strip right here is because of, of over 95% of the copper that was ever mined from the Keweenaw Peninsula comes from this little strip here. So why is the Keweenaw important? Why is the copper country important? Well, even up to this day, it is still the largest known native copper deposit in the world. And during its uh, around 150 years of mining, it produced over 14 billion pounds of refined copper and about 23 million ounces of silver mined over the entire peninsula. It's also the place where the largest single piece of native copper was ever discovered, a single mass estimated to weigh about 520 tons. That's a, that's a piece of copper about the size of a coach bus or a Greyhound bus, so a large piece. It's also the first major mining rush in the United States, and I'll explain the reason why, why people believe that, why historians believe that a little bit later on in the presentation. And between 1850 and 1887, so a period of about 37 years, this area produced over 75% of the, of the US copper until the large mines out in Bisbee and Morency and Bingham Canyon got up and running the large open pit mines. So of course we can't have a copper country until we actually form it. And so originally this area was flat lying Canadian shield rocks, um, about 3 billion years old. So a lot of Archean gneisses and granites and metamorphic rocks of that, of that period. And then about 1.1 billion years ago, a rifting event occurred near this area. And it's thought that that rifting event was due to a mantle plume that had come up from, of course, the mantle. And later compression, from the Grenville orogeny to the east, burial by um, carbonates during a time when seas covered this area, and then glacial advance and retreat to scrape off all those carbonates, carbonates and expose this peninsula. So let's go back to the rifting event because that is very important in the formation. So of course we see this rift down here in the lower left-hand corner. This, this picture is from Iceland. Um, I wish it was from the Keweenaw, but it's not. And uh, this is what the Keweenaw was thought to have looked like, however, during these 
these um, rift eruptions. And so what happens is as this magma and as this lava is, is erupted onto the surface, it spreads out in a, in a basin or small basin here. As we get more and more lavas erupting, that, that basin sinks. And then when the eruptions subside, you start getting sediments coming in from the edges of this basin to start filling in this uh, on top of the basalts. Then you have another series of lava flows and eruptions, and then more sediments, and then more basalt, more sediments over and over and over again. This, this goes on for about a million and a half years until finally you end up with something that looks like this. And so here is our basin, here is our pre uh, mid-continent rift rocks, our crystalline basement, our Archean rocks. Here we have our succession of basalts and sediments. And then once eruptions stop completely, now you start getting more and more sediments coming in off from the highlands to the southeast and the northwest. And if you notice, if you track these lava flows in this basin, you'll notice that many of the same lava flows that we see on the Keweenaw Peninsula also outcrop on Isle Royal across Lake Superior here, distance of about 90 kilometers. And so we in fact see the same lava flow called the Greenstone Flow on Isle Royal that we do on the Keweenaw Peninsula. Now, this is a plain view map. If we look at a map view, we would we'll see that the edges of these flows in fact form the backbone of our Keweenaw Peninsula. And this is where our coppers are found in. They're found mostly in the, what's called the Portage Lake Volcanics, which is the basalt flows, but then also inner flow conglomerates um, within that portage group. So how do we actually get the copper forming? Well, that copper forms during that low, during low grade burial metamorphism and compression. Remember, I talked about that, that Grenville orogeny to the east that basically compressed this entire area and, and in, in essence stopped those lava flows. Also, with, that, with the burial of this area from those sediments that came off the, the highlands after volcanism had stopped. So you, so you buried this stuff, you heat it up slightly, and you get fluids deriving from that. Those fluids, I don't like calling them water because they're not really a composition of water, they're, they're fluids, are generated from this burial metamorphism. In addition, we know that basalts carry copper ions in sufficient quantities to produce native copper. And so what's happening here is you have these fluids that are leaching copper from the basalts. And those, those fluids are basically carried as warm liquid brines. Those copper-laden brines then are traveling through this area in fractures and faults that were created during rifting and also during the compression of this time. And those fractures and faults provide the pathways needed to move this, these copper fluids around. Once the area cools, we then start getting copper coming out of solution out of those fluids and they get deposited in pore spaces, such as fissure veins, which are cross-cutting veins, the basalt flow tops, and the inner flow conglomerates within those Portage Lake volcanics. So just a little explanation of what these ore types are. So here we see a piece of massive copper. This is pure native copper here sticking out of the wall uh, from the Baltic mine, which is a little bit south of Houghton. We see a miner here, presumably a, a mining captain here, a, a, a supervisor underground. And so again, these large pieces of copper like to form in these cross-cutting fissure veins. However, we do find also copper forming in the, what are called brecciated and amygdaloidal flow tops. In the Keweenaw Peninsula, um, as with any other basalt, you have a lot of gases that are being trapped in that basalt. As those gases are being released, they form cavities in those rocks in the upper parts of those, of those basaltic flow tops. Once these fluids have a chance to go through that, um, those tops, it cools and basically the copper ions drop out. And that's what you're seeing here. All of these little spots here is native copper 
in those gas bubbles. So we see a whole piece here. Below that, we see a piece that's been sliced. And again, you can see that, that um, those little gas pockets that are now filled with native copper. In addition, you also see conglomerates in the peninsula as well. Those I mentioned those interflow conglomerates earlier. And anywhere there's pore space in these conglomerates, you can get native copper coming out of solution and depositing in those open barren areas within that conglomerate. And uh, we'll mention a little bit more about this conglomerate here in a few minutes and why it was so important to uh, the mining history of the Keweenaw. Now, Europeans were not the first peoples to explore and um, find this copper. Um, native peoples of the land, as much as 8,000, seven to 8,000 years ago, had discovered these, these copper deposits, both on the surface and in shallow um, pits. And that's what we see here. We see a painting here of these native peoples depicting their mining operation here. On the right, we see one of those trenches that can still be visited today near, near the town of Delaware in the, uh, in the peninsula. So as I said, early exploration, these people mined bedrock from the bedrock and also float copper, not copper that floats in water. This is glacial float that was picked up by the glaciers and moved around starting about 7,000 years ago. And historians and, and the like have actually found around 1,200 of these mining pits and trenches that were on small fissures, both on the peninsula and on Isle Royal on that island out in Lake Superior. It's thought that in order to extract this copper, they used a couple of different methods, one of which was a method called hammer stones. That's what we see up here in this upper right-hand picture. And that is a hammer stone. And they thought that these native peoples simply just pounded the rock into oblivion to get to the native copper. It's also thought that these people may have used a technique called fire setting, where they would basically heat up a rock, build a fire in front of it, heat it up, and then throw cold water on it in, hand, in, in basically shattering that basaltic rock that was on it, but leaving the copper behind. I sometimes wonder how many, uh, how many of these folks were actually seriously injured or even killed from this method of doing this. Um, what did they use this for? They mostly used it for tools, for ornaments, and for trading. Um, and so they traded, we've seen, we found Michigan copper as far south in, as the current states of Georgia and also out west. We have found um, different tools and ornaments as well. And that's what we see down here in the lower part here. We see that, uh, we see the, uh, the, some of the tools and some of the things they use like arrowheads, um, um, axes. I, have, I actually have some fishing hooks that were that they used as well. Now, being that they were using this, they actually believed that these large copper boulders held very powerful but benevolent spirits. And so in the beginning, these native peoples were very reluctant to share any information about these large pieces with anyone that visited the area. Uh -oh, what happened here? There we go, sorry about that. So, however, a Jesuit missionary named Claude de Blon in 1667, when he visited this area, some of those native peoples um, trusted him enough to show him a piece of native copper float that they had known about for centuries before. And they took him to this boulder and he saw it and really didn't think much of it. And so, but he did report it back to his uh, people and word got out that, hey, there was, there may, there may be riches in this area. And so in uh, 1766, the next exploration led by Alexander Henry came to this area. He saw the boulder, this massive piece of copper and thought, it must have come from these hills that are along the side of the Ontonagon River. What he didn't realize was, is that those, those cliffs were made of mostly of sandstones and clays. And so when they tried to mine into the side of these, they, those hills simply collapsed 
And so that was abandoned. It wasn't until 1820 that the next exploration by um, headed up by Lewis Cass and Henry Schoolcraft came to this area. And that's what we see here in this, in this um, pencil drawing here. This is the Lewis, the Lewis um, or excuse me, Cass Schoolcraft expedition of 1820. And they saw this boulder as well. Now, for anyone that knows the Antonagon boulder, and you know that today the, the boulder is at the Smithsonian Institute, you know that this boulder is about three foot square, weighs about 3,700 pounds. So the size depicted in the picture compared to the canoes versus the actual size, hey, even then there were great fish stories, it, it, it would seem like. But on successive exploration trips by Cass and school, Schoolcraft, they basically took a young um, apprentice geologist named Douglas Houghton. And he is a fascinating person. He was born in 1809 in Troy, New York, and graduated from Rensselaer Scientific School, now known as Rensselaer Institute of Technology, in 1830 with honors in geology and medicine. And he was trained as a doctor, but he always had a fleeting interest in geology. And he joined the Cass Schoolcraft expeditions to the then Michigan Territory. Michigan would not become a state until 1837. He was there in the early 30s as an apprentice and he saw the Antonagon Boulder. And when he saw it in his journal, he wrote quite disappointing yet encouraging because he knew as a geologist that that boulder of native copper could not have come far, that it had to be a local source for that copper. As I said, Michigan became a US state in 1837 and they appointed Douglas Houghton their first state geologist. He was also the first professor of geology and mineralogy at the University of Michigan in 1839. And over the next few years, he took several trips up to the Upper Peninsula and completed his first comprehensive geologic report on the Keweenaw Peninsula in 1841. And he wrote in that report that while there was copper in the Keweenaw Peninsula, he was very cautious about just how much there was. Now, sadly, he would not live long enough to see this area take off as he drowned in Lake Superior in the fall of 1845. And so um, there were two boats. He was in one of them. He had two guides with him and, uh, and his dog, which is pictured here in this painting, uh, Miami. Only one of the guides in Miami survived. Um, Douglas Houghton unfortunately drowned. And as I said, he would never see what this area would become. Soon after Houghton's report was published, however, a mining rush began. So even though he was cautiously optimistic, that didn't stop people from invading this area. And so much so that in 1843, the US government opens a mineral land office in Copper Harbor up at the tip of the peninsula. The next year in 1844, the Pittsburgh and Boston Mining Company begins mining near Copper Harbor. And this is considered the first serious American mining attempt. Serious because it is the first mining attempt that is backed by wealthy financiers in New York and Boston on the East Coast. And so they put the money into this to open up this area for mining. However, by the fall of 1844, this mine is, is abandoned due to poor returns. And that's, this is the actual shaft that we see here in this photo. However, when Pittsburgh and Boston Mining Company um, started exploring up there, they had other areas. And when this mine was abandoned due to poor returns, they sent out exploration geologists all up and down the peninsula. And there is a story that one of their exploration geologists was walking along the top of a cliff along that greenstone flow. And he slipped at the top and fell down, fell all slid down the side of that slope all the while getting his backside cut up and scraped up. And um, when he got to the bottom, he turned around and he looked up and he saw pieces of copper sticking out of the ground. And it's said that 
It's surprising that he survived from his injuries, but that fall of his would end up being the Cliff Mine. And the Cliff was the second mine started by Pittsburgh and Boston in 1845, in the spring of 1845. And it became the first large scale profitable mine on the Keweenaw Peninsula. In fact, between 1845 and 1854, it was the most productive copper mine in the United States. And this particular mine opened up on one of those fissures that I talked about earlier, those cross-cutting fissures. During this time, several other mines open along the peninsula, including the, the Central, the Northwestern, Minnesota, Adventure, Phoenix, and Quincy, all on Fisher veins. And before the cliff closes, they reward its investors with over two and a half million dollars in dividends. So a very successful early mine. However, a change in mining was to come. In 1853, the Powabic Mining Company organized on top of the hill just north of Hancock, Michigan. They opened their first shaft on a prehistoric mining pit that followed an apparent vein of native copper. So they saw copper in the bottom of this pit and decided to drive a shaft into it. That vein turned out to be a narrow bed of amygdaloidal or load copper, that copper that formed within those gas bubbles at the top of those lava, on the top of those basalt flows. And the Pawabic found it much more profitable to mine this load copper, this Pawabic load, instead of mass copper. And so they switched their operations from basically a fisher to mining out that Pawabic load. Now let's step back here just a little bit because just south of where the Pawabic would form, um, would open up that shaft, another mining company, another small mining company called the Quincy Mining Company organized in 1848. They began mining mass copper out of a fissure. But by 1855, the Quincy Mining Company was nearly bankrupt because they were solely going after these large masses of copper. However, in 1856, Quincy discovered that the richest part of that Pawabic load, that amygdaloidal flow of copper, ran across their property. So they immediately shifted focus to mining load copper. Now, if they ran across a big mass of copper, they surely wouldn't turn it down. But it wasn't their primary focus. They were going after this load copper that was much more profitable and much more um, um, you could find it with more regularity. In other words, it was a consistent source as opposed to those mass pieces. And so in 1855, production just rose from a few tons of copper being produced to 153 tons by 1858. And employment jumped from mostly summer miners in 1856 to over 500 full-time year-round workers by 1860. And in 1860, mining operations yielded about 970 tons of copper ore and over 1,000 tons per year thereafter. Um, later on, it would be much more than 1,000 tons per year. And by 1861, a major event occurred. Revenue finally exceeded expenditures, and they were able to pay their shareholders continuous dividends between 1862 and 1920. Hence the nickname Old Reliable. And the only thing that stopped those dividends in 1920 was the installation of the Nordberg steam hoist that they had uh, put in, in in 1920. Meanwhile, further north, um, around the current towns of Calumet and Lorium, a brilliant geologist named E.J. Hulbert discovered the rich Calumet conglomerate. So now we're going from basaltic flow tops where we find copper to now those pore spaces within that conglomerate. And by rich, um, I mean very rich. Over its almost 100 year, um, this mine averaged 2.85% ore grade of native copper. And in some instances, they were pulling out copper as much as 60%. That's basically 1,200 pounds of copper 
or, uh, or about 545 kilos per ton, per basically 2,000 pounds. So 1,200 pounds of copper per 2,000 pounds of ore. That is an incredible ore deposit. In 1865, the Calumet Mining Company was organized. And then in 1866, the Hecla Mining Company formed right next door. Now, by 1870, however, E.J. Holbert was stripped of his mine management duties. As good of a geologist as Holbert was, he was a horrible mine manager and a horrible mine superintendent. And so the board of directors stripped him of his management, and he was replaced by Alexander Agassiz. Alexander was the son of Louis Agassiz, the famous Swiss geologist who a lot of our ideas of glaciation in geology come from. By 1871, the two companies merged, forming what many people know as the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company, or CNH. When that occurred, they pretty much produced an empire. They built the town of Red Jacket, which is now known as Calumet. Between 1869 and 1876, Calumet, Hecla, and CNH was the world leader in copper production. And by 1901, the underground mine complex had about 16 shafts, with the Tamarack being the world's deepest at that time of just over a mile, 5,500 feet. In 1906, copper production peaked at CNH with over 100 million pounds of copper being produced during that year. Now, I could go into an entire talk about the great strike of 1913 that hit the copper country, but I just want to uh, touch, just want to touch on it briefly here. Up until that strike, the peninsula was, and the mines up there were pretty much going strong. After that strike, however, you see um, copper prices begin to fall throughout the teens and 20s. Also, as these mines went deeper, or percentages declined as they got deeper down. They were getting away from those flow tops and they saw those percentages drop. During the Great Depression, the American Great Depression, many of the mines would either close, consolidate, or were bought out. So you basically had three powerful companies. You had Calumet and Hecla that either consolidated or bought out other mines north of Portage Lake, so north of Houghton Hancock, you have the Copper Range Company that did the same thing south of Portage Lake, south of Houghton and Hancock. The lone operation who never merged and never consolidated was Quincy. They kept on strong up until 1931 when they ceased operation, but they did not dissolve. By 1937, Quincy reopens when the US government subsidizes the price of copper. Um, tensions in the world were starting to escalate and so the government decided to subsidize the price of copper. Once World War II ended, however, that contract ran out on August 31st of 1945 and Quincy closed their mining operations the next day on September 1st. However, Quincy would continue with reclamation activities on the peninsula up until 1967, when those two finally shut down. And over its lifespan of about 99 years, Quincy produces over 1.5 billion pounds of copper and about four and a half million ounces of silver. By 1968, another major mining strike hits the copper country. And this one was focused again on Calumet and Hecla. And rather than settle with the workers and the unions of that time, CNH was sold to Universal Oil Products. And at that time, operations were then permanently closed in October of 1968. However, there was some glimmer of hope that maybe the two sides could resolve their differences and mining could, um, could re, um, reopen again. However, that was not to be and the dewatering pumps were then shut down in 1970, thus ending the CNH empire. But over that period, CNH would produce over 4.2 billion pounds of copper during its, during, its, during its lifetime. After 1968, 
White Pine was the lone operating mine on the peninsula. So White Pine sits kind of south and west of Ontonagon. And this mine was owned by Copper, the Copper Range Company. Now they mined copper in a little different way. They mined a copper sulfide in a form of calcasite from a siltstone shale layer called the Nunsuch Shale. But they too closed in 1997 due to the fall in the price of copper and from local environmental groups. And when they closed, that ended about 150 years of continuous copper mining on the Keweenaw. Now, there are some other mines that have since reopened. Um, the Eagle Mine, which is kind of northwest of Marquette, Michigan, but they're mostly a uh, lead, zinc, and PGE mine, platinum group development mine. But another mine just to the east of Porcupine Mountains National, or Porcupine Mountain State Park, rather, and uh, kind of east of Ontonagon, just got their permits approved. And so there is a chance that copper mining could return to the Keweenaw Peninsula soon. But I know most of you are probably here to uh, basically learn about the minerals that are found up there. And so there are still minerals to be found up there. Um, you can, and there's several ways you can get them. You can be my, basically be my wife and, and, and swing about a 10 to 12 pound sledgehammer busting rocks. You can dig a big hole on the beach and basically look for gems and goodies that way. Or the most common way is to basically take your metal detector and just search some of the piles up there, some of the poor rock piles left by these mines up there. And so let's take a look then at some of these minerals that are found up there. And so we'll start out with this beautiful analcyme and copper. This is from the Phoenix mine. Um, you can see the sizes here. So when I go through these, these photos, you'll see where they're from, the size, and basically it's the photographer. If, it, if the photographer is not listed, it's probably my photo. And so this is regarded as the best anal seam and copper that's found in the AE Seam and Mirror Museum. And you can see the size, it's about five and a half by six and a half centimeters. So a pretty decent sized piece of anal seam. Um, this is an, an anal seam with microcline. That's what's giving it that reddish color. This is one that I found on the piles at the Phoenix mine. And again, field of view here, about five and a half centimeters. So a very nice, well-formed anal seam. Calcite is another mineral that can be found up there. Most people are probably familiar with the copper included calcites, but there are regular calcites as well up there. This is from the Copper Falls mine. So this is near Eagle, Eagle Harbor. Um, the largest crystal on there is about one and a half centimeters. This is about one and a half centimeters tall and field of view about six centimeters. But there are small minerals to be found up there as well. A lot of people believe that there's basically only big minerals up there, but for the micromounter, there are also some very neat specimens. This is a piece of calcite from the St. Louis Exploration near Lorium. And you can see the field of view, it's only five millimeters. But again, these nice, really well-formed um, calcite crystals can be found there. You also get chalcedony, so basically the silicon dioxide that is basically can be a replacement. And so what we're seeing here is cal original calcite that has been replaced by chalcedony and also iron manganese oxides. These are from the lakeshore traps. This is another one of those lava flows, the very, some of the very latest lava flows on the peninsula that are found along the shores of Lake Superior. I mentioned calcocyte from White Pine Mine to the south. But on rare occurrences, you can also find calcocyte at other places. This is from the Clark Mine, which is near Copper Harbor. And again, you see that field of view. It's about 3.2 millimeters. So it's a very small, but very nice piece of calcite, or calcocyte rather. Another calcocyte, this is from the Mendota Mine. So this is a little further south in the peninsula. And again, you can see the sizes of these. Field of view, 2.8 millimeters. So very small, but very nice, very well-formed little crystals of these uh, calcocytes. Chrysocola, this comes out of the conglomerates um, as one of our um, super gene minerals up there. Uh, this is from the Alloway conglomerate mine. You can see this kind of 
bluish green color here, that is the chrysocolla. And this piece is about six centimeters across, but you can find pieces of this. I, I've seen pieces the size of bowling balls found up there. So again, not really a micro mineral, but very pretty nonetheless. Of course, what the peninsula is known for is copper. Um, but in this area, copper can form all sorts of different ways. So here we see a beautiful copper crystal from the Quincy mine with quartz and epidote. And you look at the size of this, eight and a half centimeters across that crystal is 1.5 centimeters, very well formed piece of uh, copper here. And that is the one unique thing about the Keweenaw Peninsula is just the how nice the crystals are, how well formed they are, and also just the different varieties. Here we see a twinned um, copper crystal from the Centennial Mine. Again, another one of the A.E. Seaman Mineral Museum specimens. And again, this piece is about six and a half centimeters tall, so pretty good size. Here we see copper with several different crystal forms on it. And so this one is from the Copper Falls mine, again, where that calcite was found earlier. Uh, field of view about seven and a half, a little over seven millimeters across. You can just see all the different crystal forms on that piece, on just one single specimen. Um, several years ago, a deposit of copper was found at the bottom of Lake Superior in about 10 to 15 foot of water. And this is one of those specimens. This is from the Laker pocket just offshore. Uh, this particular piece was collected by Bob Barron. Of course, he's known for the 17 ton boulder that was found in about 10 to 12 feet of water and generally the same location as where these come from. And what's unique about these specimens is that you see different oxidations on here. You see this kind of, kind of reddish color here, darker red that's um, um, tannerite. You see more reddish here, brighter red. That's a more of a cuprite color. This on this on the left or right side rather, no one's really sure exactly what forms that got lime green on there at this point. But again, several pieces of this out there, several pieces out in the market of these as well. You can also get cubes. So here we see copper in epidote from the South Kearsarge mine. Um, Again, field of view, five millimeters. So that cube is very tiny, probably not more than about a millimeter, a millimeter and a half across. But again, very sharp, well-formed crystals. But you can also get cubes that are elongated. That's what we're seeing here. This piece here is about 1.8 centimeters tall, comes from the Northwestern mine. This is up near Central in Keweenaw County. And again, you can see this kind of branching, um, elongated cubes that form. Can also get hoppers, hopper crystals forming as well. This one's from the Amik mine. This is another one of the Seaman Mineral Museum specimens. This piece here, the entire piece is almost six centimeters with the largest crystal being about 1.6 centimeters across. Then you can get some weird oddities going. So here we see a little button of copper, so kind of a crude copper crystal on a stalk of native silver. We haven't talked much about silver yet, but we will here in a few minutes. And so again, you can just kind of get these weird kind of associations and weird crystals forming here. Copper skulls, these are formed in the conglomerates where you have a piece of rhyolite cobble that is in that conglomerate and then the copper forms around it. Later on, that cobble gets either busted up or um, busted up by hand. And uh, it leaves this cavity here in these, this copper. And that's where you get these skulls. So this is an open area all the way down in here. And this piece here is rather large, about 9.2 centimeters tall. This one was actually self-collected. I collected this one myself at the Red Jacket Shaft, which is just northwest of Calumet in, a, uh, in, the, in the poor rock piles that are found there, or at least used to be found there. You can also get coppers forming wires. And so we see from the Rhode Island mine, which is about halfway between Calumet and Houghton, you get these beautiful copper wires that can form um, within the quartz. That's what this is in here, quartz and a little bit of epidote. But sometimes you get some really odd things happening where you get a copper wire 
where you end up having a very neat little calcite ROM attached. And this piece here, the field of view is just about one centimeter. So you can imagine how small that piece of uh, that little calcite ROM is. But again, you kind of occasion, you do get weird things forming like that. Of course, everyone is familiar with the copper and calcites that come up there, some of the best in the world. This particular one is from the Quincy mine. Uh, it's about three and a half centimeters across. And this comes from Gale and Jim Spann. This piece was originally in the Peabody Museum um, at one time. So again, very beautiful copper and calcite. Uh, this one's from a little bit further north in the peninsula. This is from the Copper Falls mine, again, near Eagle Harbor. And you can see this, uh, this copper within that calcite. So here's our calcites. We can see some copper leaf here forming. So again, very beautiful specimens. Of course, everybody knows about the copper included agates that are found up there. There are only two places that they are found. One is at the Wolverine mine, shaft number two. The other is at Calumet and Hecla shaft number 21. And again, these beautiful coppers that replace some of the bands within those agates. Uh, there's another specimen from the museum, mineral museum up there. And again, a little bit bigger. This one's about three and a half centimeters across. Um, there was just a recent find of some bigger ones, upwards of about five or so centimeters across that were just found this past summer from that area as well. Cooperite, you do find up there. Not very much, it's kind of a rare mineral up there, but you do find it. Uh, this again is from the St. Louis exploration near Lorium. Datalite and prinite. So datalite does form up there, but in honesty, datalite crystals from the Keweenaw are extremely rare. Only a couple of localities up there that actually form well, well formed crystals. Most common up there though, are these beautiful colored nodules that you find up there. And these again, these form in the, in the uh, amygdaloidal flow tops and they come in a wide range of colors. Um, but some of the most unique ones and some of the rarer ones are these kind of orangish red ones that come from the Flint steel mine in Ontonagon County. You do occasionally find them that are kind of a greenish blue color that are um, quite rare on the peninsula. These ones here actually are embedded with um, copper throughout. This is from the Centennial Mine, just north of uh, Calumet. And then you find some that have a range of colors. So this one here's the um, kind of the orange and it goes into a yellow, which is highly desirable for uh, data light collectors in the Keweenaw. And there's a little bit of copper in here. You see it kind of down here and along the edge up here. Um, this piece is quite large, about nine centimeters across as well. So again, very colorful specimens. Um, domakite, which is a copper arsenate mineral. Um, there's just a few mines around the Mohawk and Amik area that produce these. And so on occasion, you will see these um, in the piles in those areas. You also see them at some shows as well on occasion. Um, not to be mistaken for silver, because when, this, when these pieces are, are freshly cut or freshly polished, they look like a, a knob of silver. So you think, wow, I have, I have this big, you know, eight, 10, 15 pound piece of silver. Well, it's probably domakite rather than silver. Epidote, much of the epidote we've seen so far has been that nice dark green color. But on the Keweenaw Peninsula, you do find micro minerals of epidote micro specimens that are yellow in color. And so we see a beautiful little spray here of epidote again from the St. Louis exploration. That's again, about four and a half millimeter field of view. Um, here's another epidote from the St. Louis exploration. And again, you see that kind of that yellowish kind of trending the green in this one a little bit. Um, but again, most of the micro epidotes up there tend to be this nice bright yellow color. Fluoropopolite, um, the potassium form of it, K, is also found up there. This one here is from the Wolverine mine, shaft number two. And you can actually see how we have this crystal of quartz here. And right at the very tip, you have these fluoropopolites that have formed on here. So again, a very unique association here 
um, and just the just the um, the crystal shapes on those, and just how and where they form. Fluorite. This is a also a recent find in the past twenty or thirty years. There's one place on the Keweenaw Peninsula near Eagle River, a place called Silver Creek in the in the um, conglomerates, where fluorite has been found. It's kind of beautiful, kind of lime green blue fluorite up there, and it has produced some um, some cubes, some octahedrons, but most of it is massive. Um, shaped like this, but again, very beautiful color. Hematite, you do see hematite up there as well. Sometimes it can form very beautiful little blades in the vesicles in those former gas bubbles. So here we see our hematite blades with some quartz here. And then this outer edge here is um, chlorite in the uh, chlorite trending towards chamosite. Kenoite, one of the um, copper, calcium copper silicates that form up there. Um, you know, many of the mines in Arizona produce very beautiful specimens of this, but the Keweenaw also produces some nice specimens. This is from the Lorium mine, um, just south of Calumet and Lorium. And you can see very beautiful blade or very beautiful rods in here formed within quartz. You can also get other minerals as well. So here we have quartz with the blue kinoites and these, these red lip, lipidocrosites that are forming in here as well as almost little droplets, it appears within the quartz. These again, come from the Lorium mine, just south of uh, Calumet and Lorium towns. And again, you can see just how small these are. The field of view is only 1.6 millimeters on these. So very beautiful, but very small. Laumontite, lots of laumontite up there. However, it doesn't last very long. It very it um, um, deteriorates and dries up very, very quickly. So in order to have specimens like this, you need to very quickly find a way to preserve them. And uh, that's what we that's what we've seen here. So again, from the St. Louis exploration, about two and a half millimeters across. McFallite. This is a one of those um, calcium manganese minerals um, found at its type locality, which is the manganese mine near Copper Harbor. And again, it just forms these beautiful red uh, prismatic rods. Um, this again, very small, about two and a half millimeters across the field of view. So again, very small, but very beautiful. Malachite, so another one of those post, um, um, Post forming, uh, post uh, rip forming minerals. Uh, this one here is formed on a nice, cute little copper crystal from the Medora mine. Again, kind of in the southern part of the peninsula. And again, you can see field of view three millimeters, so quite small, but they do occur. Um, typically, your malachite up there is going to form these little spheres um, in quartz. That's what we're seeing here. Microcline, a lot of people kind of scoff at the fact that microcline can create nice little crystals, but that's what we're seeing here. And so the red is the microcline. The yellow on there is actually some of that epidote again that we see. And this comes from the Nebraska mine um, in Ontonagon County, which sits right next door to the Caledonia mine, which a lot of people know for these for silver and also for those nice um, maroon dark red Datalite nodules that are found there. Orientite with McFallite. So here again, another one of the type localities uh, minerals from the manganese mine near Copper Harbor. So our McFallite is this kind of darker red here. Our orientite are these orangish rods that we see in this radiating pattern here. Powellite. Powellite's very rare on the peninsula, but you do find it in certain areas, um, especially around Calumet. This is from the Tamarack mine, uh, about four and a half centimeters tall. Again, another one of the AE Seaman Mineral Museum specimens. This is the largest powellite that has ever been found on the Keweenaw. And so again, uh, quite rare up there, but it, you do find it occasionally. 
Uh, the Keweenaw is also known for its beautiful prenite specimens. So here's a piece of prenite from the central mine with some, uh, some epidote and little pieces of copper on there scattered around, little small copper crystals. Uh, sometimes you do find it um, um, associated with larger pieces of copper. This is from the Medora mine. So again, near Copper Harbor. This one's got a nice coating of cuprite on it with this beautiful green prenite. But then sometimes you find true oddities again. And so here we see prenite, these little rods here, these worms here. And when you look very closely, you see little buttons of copper attached to the end of these prenite worms. So again, a very unique, uh, very odd specimen up there to get this kind of association. Pompeliite also found up there as well. Um, that's these kind of green radiating little tufts right here. Um, in this specimen here, this is in a, in a uh, cavity of quartz. This little yellow piece right here, that is actually saponite. And again, you tend to find these um, at the St. Louis exploration, but you can find these all over the peninsula, um, you know, up and down the peninsula, these little tufts of Pompeliite like this. You can also find them in little radiating groups like this. Uh, this is again from the St. Louis Exploration. Um, field of view about five and a, a little over five millimeters. But when you think of Papeliite from the Copper Country, most people, whoop, got one more photo here, yeah. So um, not only uh, green Papeliite, but you can also get yellow Papeliite as well. Um, this is in a, again, a little cavity of quartz here. So again, we see this kind of yellowish colored Papeliite. There is the photo I thought was after that other one. So again, when people though think of Pompeliite from the Keweenaw, they think of the famous Isle Royal Greenstones. And that's what we see here is this more massive form. It's from the Delaware mine. And again, for the peninsula, this is a rather large specimen at about three and a half centimeters across. Typically on the peninsula, they don't usually get over about two, maybe a little over two centimeters. They find the really big ones, you have to go to Isle Royal. But since that's a national park, no collecting allowed. Um, I mentioned saponite before. So here's a little bit uh, more saponite. That's these kind of yellowish tufts here, these radiating tufts here. But in this one here, we have quartz as well. Behind that quartz, that greenish color is pompeliite. And again, we see that lepidocrosite in this, in these quartz crystals here, these little iron droplets that have formed within that quartz crystal. This is again from the Loria mine, um, Houghton County. I promised I'd talk about silver. So here is a self-collected silver and copper specimen from the Caledonia mine. And this piece is rather large, 13.1 centimeters across. Uh, if you look at this closely, there are a couple of little small uh, scepter crystals on there. There's also a huge chisel mark in this piece, and that has a story in and of itself. The collector, whose name will not be mentioned, me, um, was going after some copper and silver and saw a little piece sticking out of the wall. And when I went and chiseled into it, I didn't realize that there was this much silver behind it. So there's a nice chisel mark right in this area here from that, um, from that trip. Still a nice specimen, and with, even with the chisel chip in there, has a very great story behind it. But Caledonia is not the only player in town when we talk about silver. Much of the silver was found up and down the peninsula. This particular piece here comes from the Phoenix Mine. And again, beautiful little scepter crystal here. It's about 5.1 millimeters tall on this piece of copper. From the famous silver pit near Copper Falls mine, this is a beautiful little um, arborescent group of branching. You see the see the branching formation here. Each one of these are little silver crystals along this, and again about 3.1 centimeters tall from that famous silver pit. Sadly, the silver pit does not exist anymore. It was filled in, and now it's, now is on private property, so you cannot get access to these. Although if you were at the New Mexico Mineral Symposium this past weekend, you, um, you would have heard that there are other 
pockets of silver that have been found up and down the peninsula as well. So more people are out finding silver these days uh, just using metal detectors. But in my mind, probably the best silver specimen to ever come from the Keweenaw Peninsula is this beautiful one that's in the Seaman Mineral Museum. This is out of the cliff mine. And you can just see the size of it, 10 centimeters by eight centimeters. So a huge piece. These are all individual silver crystals you see here. And one thing I didn't mention earlier is that some of the earliest collectors up there, so um, Lucius Lee Hubbard, who, who, who uh, had this piece, but also John Thorley Reader were two famous collectors up there during the mining days. And so they had access to these specimens and many of those specimens are now preserved in museums for us to look at. And especially the AE Seaman Mineral Museum, they have probably the largest collection of Hubbard and Reader specimens around. So I wanna kind of wrap this up a little bit with um, some not really natural specimens, but man-made specimens, human specimens. So these are a pair of copper chisel chips. These are from the cliff mine. The largest chip is about 12 centimeters long, so across. And these are formed, especially in the early mines, those early fissure mines, where before block powder and before dynamite, or excuse me, before dynamite, um, and before, powered drills and that, teams of miners, usually in threes, would go down and chop, have to chop up these large masses of copper before they could pull them out of the ground. In that process, they would create these chisel chips from those masses. And even today at the Cliff Mine, you can still find um, these chisel chips laying out in the pile from those early days. Now, Occasionally, you had dignitaries that would come to those to the mines in the Keweenaw, either from the investment groups or um, very important people in the federal government or, or even the, the uh, presidents of the mining companies. And so the mining companies would get wind of this and they would employ their best group of miners to make a kind of a souvenir or a momentum for these dignitaries. And they would create these these pieces called copper fans. Now, most of the fans are usually are pretty small. They're not more than maybe six, eight, 10 centimeters across. But on occasion, depending on who was coming up, they would create big ones. And this is one of those big ones. This is almost 40 centimeters across from tip to tip. And this one, um, it's not sure where exactly it come from, but it has a very interesting history behind it. This specimen was in the possession of a guy by the name of Wesley Clark. He was a captain at the Copper Falls mine, and he came to America, came to the Copper Falls mine from Cornwall, England in the 1880s. And he worked there, and eventually um, he passed away from a mining accident. However, the company was nice enough to let his family stay in the agent's house of this time. Um, however, on Memorial Day of 1837, that agent's house caught fire and burned to the ground. And there's some mystery behind that because supposedly the next day, they were supposed to, uh, supposed to get electricity installed in that house. So a little bit of a mystery there. But after that fire, uh, Wesley Clark's son, William, went to that house because he knew that this specimen and two Lake Superior agates, about, that's thought to be about the size, somewhere between a volleyball and a bowling ball, were in that house. William actually recovered this fan from those ashes. However, those two large agates were never found. Recently, the AE Seaman Mineral Museum was donated this piece from William Clark's family and is now on permanent display at the museum. And if you look real closely, especially along this edge right here, you can still see some of the burn scars from
from that fire in 1937 on this piece. Now, I know a lot of people like to say that when you see a rainbow, that there is a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Well, I kind of disagree with that a little bit. I like to think that at the end of a rainbow is a beautiful copper mine in there. And not only at, at the end of one rainbow, but at the end of two rainbows. And so with that, I thank you for your attendance. Thank you for watching this. And if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and uh, fire away. We'll, we'll see if I can answer them. Do you, do you want to stop sharing and? Yeah, let me let me stop share. There we go. I I, I might kick off. I've got a, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, first one is the region itself still considered uh, geologically active, like in terms of the um, igneous? No. Um, basically, all once once the yeah. eruptions ended and once the um, you know, once the Grenville slapped everything shut, that pre pretty much it. About the most activity you see up there right now is every once in a while, one of the mines will collapse up there and you'll, they'll actually pick it up on a seismograph um, <laughs> from on occasion. And so, but as far as, you know, geologic tectonic activity, no, nah, there's nothing up there right now. Uh, pretty stable. All right. Um, do, we, do we know what sort of estimates there are of copper remaining in the peninsula? It is said that they only removed about, uh, based on estimates, of course, about 40 to 50% of the copper has been removed from up there. So there's still supposedly a lot of copper in the ground up there yet, but these days it's just too hard to get. You know, yeah. much of it's very deep. You know, some of those mines, Quincy mine went down um, almost 9,300 feet down. Um, Red Jacket um, went down um, about 9,600 feet. And so, uh, it, to these days, it's just too much to go and uh, go after it. You know, you, you, you have to pump out, what, almost two miles of water yeah. out of some of those mines these days. Uh, now I've got one last question. Okay. Um, with the data light nodules, um, are they fairly characteristic from the different mines? Can you see one and say that is likely to be from a particular mine? You can, to some extent, like those um, those bluish green ones that I showed with the copper in them from Centennial, those tend to be very specific oh, for Centennial no. or that area. Um, I can see that this presentation went to the dogs, and so, <laughs> um, but um, like those, like the really like dark maroon brick red ones, um, those tend to be from Caledonia a lot. But you do find them elsewhere in the peninsula, like some of the oranges you tend to see from the southern part of the district, so Ontonagon mm -hmm. Way. Um, but you can tell sometimes about the color. Also, if you look at the back sides, you know, because the back sides of those nodules kind of look like a cauliflower, the head of a cauliflower. And sometimes you can see that the different color on the back side can give you some indication too as to where they're from. Cool, thank you. Um, anybody else have questions for Paul? Yep, Doug. Just curious, that last slide in the presentation with the rainbow, hmm? where did you get that picture? That is one of my pictures taken right after they, um, during the Keweenaw Mineral Days up there, they have a swap, rock swap at Quincy Mine. In and that photo was, uh, I'd, I'd have to look to see what year it was. Because I have a picture just like it. <laughs> okay. I, I was there at that rock swap and, uh, okay. and, uh, and so, there was a double rainbow right over the, the mine. So you remember oh, yeah. the torrential, so you remember the torrential downpour just before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's one of my, copper, that's where, Is there a lot ahead. of copper under the lake? There is, you, you mean on, on the lake bottom? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, it went down like this and the lake is right. above it. And I know there's copper in Al, Roy, uh, Al Royal, but uh, I didn't know if there's copper going the entire way. You know, there probably is. It would not surprise me that there's, you know, if someone was adventure enough to punch a shaft or punch something down through the bottom of Lake Superior, it wouldn't surprise me if there was copper out there somewhere, um, you know, because we see it, Look, you know, look at the Laker Pocket material, Laker Pocket 2 material. We see, um, 
you know, we see that copper ling on the uh, bottom there in those fissures. Um, the big boulder that Bob uh, Barron pulled up, you know, that's that was found on the bottom of Lake Superior. So it wouldn't surprise me that there's copper, you know, under the lake bottom as well. All right. Any other questions? I was just uh, wondering, yeah. well, thinking about the, <laughs> the, the way the copper was deposited. Um, so if the, the basalts were the source of the copper mineralization, mm -hmm. that's had, that had to be a concentrated quite a massive amount to go from disseminated copper minerals in, through the basalt into the uh, you know, with, with space filling native copper. Mm -hmm. um, so that means it's uh, been, the fluids have gone through the rock and then they've reached somewhere where they can no longer hold the copper and, and dumped it out. Mm -hmm. um, the timing of that, was that happening at the time the lava was being deposited? Like, so each new layer of lava then had a fluid mobilization event happen with it and then bring the copper to the surface? Or did it happen well after the whole thing had been buried? Do, do you know? It's, what the it's, time it was? it's it's thought to be just post volcanism. So the lavas were there, um, and then basically post volcanism because you had to have something to basically, you know, create those fluids, and the creation of those fluids was that burial metamorphism. Yeah, you know, when you had right. those sediments getting on top of it and then buried it slightly, and again. We're not talking very much metamorphism. You know, it's very, well, at least in geologic terms, very low temperature, you know, yep. low pressures. And so, but it was just enough to drive some fluids off. And those fluids then picked up those copper elements. And it's known um, from different studies, it's known that there, there was, a, well, plenty enough just copper in that basalt to basically, um, you know, get the amounts of copper that are up there. And I know just as kind of a, a side quest or a side comment to that you don't find a lot of copper because the mid kind of rift kind of has the kind of has that arc shape where it kind of goes up through start kind of starts in lake superior one arm goes down through minnesota and down into iowa the other arm goes into lower michigan but you don't see a lot of copper along there along those areas it's only right. concentrated up in the lake superior region and it's thought be that because of the bend in that rift you had a lot more fractures, a lot more faulting, a lot more pathways for that fluid to go and deposit those coppers. And that's why it's thought that there's so much copper in that area. You, you, you do get a fair amount on the eastern end of Lake Superior too, around uh, Mamance Point, kind of northwest of Sault Ste. Marie. There's a fair amount of copper there as well, but not near as much as there was on the Humanoff. So does that mean that the the copper as it the fluids as it's moving through have deposited the copper in specific bands in the in the structure, or is it at the um, top it, of the pile? Like, is there is there a structural element to the, the depositional style? Somewhat, we see a lot of the a lot of the copper is found in in those amygdal in those basaltic flow tops, whether it's amygdaloidal. Yeah you know, brecciated, things like that. So we see them at the top of those flows and especially at the top of the big flows. Um, oddly enough, we don't see a lot of copper on the greenstone flow, which is the largest of the flows. We don't see a lot of copper in that. Um, we do see copper in the greenstone flow, but it's in the form of those cross-cutting fissure veins. Right. You know, we don't see them in the actual flow top of the greenstone flow. And that's that's a question that's kind of, you know, puzzled people as well. So, yeah, that's, so that could be chemistry controlled as well as fl mm -hmm. fluid flow, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, More than other, likely. Uh, well, go ahead. The other thing that's occurred to me is um, I've got a, a couple of pieces I recently acquired of um, copper in phrenite uh, that have been etched out of a calcite. And they're really pretty. Um, and I was lucky enough to spot a couple of dots of silver in the um and in, in, in on the specimen mm -hmm. um so you've got all these blebs of native copper and then you've got these blebs of native silver 
all on the same piece, right next to each other. Um, and of course, copper and silver will quite happily alloy together. So clearly there's something going on with the chemistry that where the, the um, copper and the silver don't combine together into an alloy uh, as part of the chemistry of, of um, mm -hmm. reduction. Any, any thoughts or understanding of why they don't, why you don't get like copper rich silver or silver rich copper? Uh, well, as opposed all, to having them separate. Right. Well, the copper up there, much of that copper up there, um, we always you like to say, because for years, I, I was actually a tour guide at Quincy Mine in my earlier college days. I, you know, I had to eat while I was up there, so I had to work someplace. Sounds like a terrible job. Yeah. It was terrible. We always yeah. used to say, and it was actually true, that the copper that they were getting out of the ground up there was anywhere between 98 to 99 percent pure copper. The only real impurity in that copper was silver. Right. Well, so, so there's know, still so, still quite a lot of silver in the copper. There is a little bit in there. There's a lot of you know I don't want to say a lot, but there's silver in it. Um, some arsenic, and recently there was some work done where they actually were finding little bits of mercury in that copper as well. And that, that comes back to just the basalts themselves and what the signature of those basalts tell us about where that lava, where that magma was generated from. I, that actually doesn't, doesn't help because I would imagine that the ratio of silver to copper as native elements would be on a similar sort of ratio. So how the hell do you get copper that's got all the silver in it and then you get silver depositing out separately? Yeah. Well, yeah, when I, I know when I did my dissertation up there, because I did that, that was actually on the copper sulfides up on the peninsula. But we looked at the coppers and we had discovered that there's at least three separate pulses of copper uh, formation up there. Okay. So they didn't occur all at once. And we only found really one single pulse of silver that did not correspond to those, to those pulses of copper up there. So it was really fascinating to uh, look at the end of, you know, kind of the timing of when these things come in. Right. So, yeah, that kind of, that would explain, I mean, diff different chemistries going through at different times. Would mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be a nice differentiator. Yeah, good question, though. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Typical chemist. <laughs> yeah, well, what can you do? I can well, ask a stupid question if you like. It's, it's all yeah. <laughs> No, I um, I got I, I I ended up getting plenty of those on the uh, on, on the mind tours when I gave them. So yeah. <laughs> um, uh, is there is it a coincidence or is there are they linked that there's so much iron just south of there? Um, well, the iron's a lot older. Um, these yeah. were formed around you know about around 1.1 or so billion years ago. The irons, and I'm sure you're talking about the Marquette Range and Ishpeming Range. Those have a date of around 2.0 to 1.8. So kind of a different, you know, you're talking almost a billion years there difference. Um, also just a whole different circumstance of uh, formation. <clears throat> right. All right, any other questions? And if not, we will finish up for today. Paul, thank you very much again. That was excellent. Very good. Um, yep. Yeah. And yeah. uh, look that forward. was worth whacking up for. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, in, in a month's time, we'll have Frank. So, looking forward to that one as well. <clears throat> Hopefully, see you all back then. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Take care, right. folks. Thanks. Take care, guys. Bye, guys. Okay. <laughs>